the thriving cultural scene with countless nonprofits, theater groups, and corporate sponsors to complement these initiatives. These public private partnerships are a good thing, and no one would have been happier to see them than my man Hamilton, who is standing in the next room. You can watch the entire ceremony in the U.S. Capitol's Statuary Hall Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, here on American History TV, only on C-SPAN 3. Next, a discussion of Civil War-era politics from Yale University's Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Speakers look at the realignment of political parties, populism, and anti-slavery politics in the 1840s and 50s leading up to the Civil War. This is about two hours. Now we take up political parties, electoral politics, the problem of slavery. Um, I was trained in this field, in part, by Dick Sewell. Um, it's considered kind of a, you know, a, a mainstream element of, an, a, of a kind of consensus American history, isn't it? But the political, the, the political history of the coming of the Civil War is as important as history can get sometimes, because it's the only time we've ever had when the political system disintegrated. Now, we got three people to talk about this, and as you can see in this conference, we have tried to mix the generations. Uh, that's <laughs> just a general comment. We are mixing the, we like to mix the generations. We don't want everybody as old as me. Our first speaker will be Pamela Brandwine, who's trained as a sociologist, did her PhD at Northwestern, she holds now a professorship in political science at the University of Michigan, uh, where she's been since, I think, at least 2007. She's also taught at UT Austin. Um, this gathering of historians invites the social scientists, too, of course. She's the author of two important books, and you'll see by the titles why these are relevant to what we're doing. The first is Rethinking the Judicial Settlement of Reconstruction, published in 2011, and the second, Reconstructing Reconstruction, the Supreme Court and the Production of Historical Truth. Now, that's a title, a title long before the age of truth, uh, the age of Trump. I mean, that was a slip. I didn't even mean that, honestly. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pamela is going to speak on the theme of rethinking party appeals in capitalist contexts. Our second speaker is Josh Lynn, who's currently a postdoc fellow here at Yale in the program, uh, the Yale Center for the Study of Representative Institutions, which is part of the Macmillan Center. Um, he did his PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also teaching a course here at Yale on Jacksonian democracy, or the era of Jacksonian democracy. He's also planned a major conference the first weekend in December right, December 2-3, first, first, first and second of December, on that old but still very important problem of, well, who was Jackson and what is this thing, Jacksonian democracy, and we'll be part of that as well. Uh, his first book uh, will, is now accepted, forthcoming from UVA Press, called Preserving the White Man's Republic, Jacksonian Democracy Race and the Transformation of American Conservatism. And he's doing a second book, I love this, and he's written already an essay about this, where I learned an enormous amount, uh, comparing Frederick Douglass and Stephen Douglass. It's, the, it's called The Black Douglass and the White Douglass. And there were, there were more, rea uh, more relationships and connections between those two than I ever realized, and I have lifted shamelessly from his article in my forthcoming book, with good footnotes. <laughs> And lastly, Joe Murphy, who helped us organize this conference, I must say, and indeed was a prime organizer of the conference on the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War at CUNY some four years ago or so. Uh, Joe did his PhD uh, with Jim Oakes at the CUNY Graduate Center, the B at Temple. Uh, he's currently a postdoc fellow for this year. I think it's an NEH fellowship at the New York Historical Society. Um, Joe is a uh, scholar of anti-slavery politics. 
and he is himself writing a book entitled, oh, I have it here, Joe, sorry. Um, oh, here it is. Neither a slave nor a king, political abolitionist, and the rise of anti-slavery nationalism. Um, Joe will speak on the theme of anti-slavery politics and the Constitution, and Josh will speak on the theme of 1850s populism, economics, or white supremacy. Okay, we'll go in the order of the program. Each person gets 15 minutes, and then we open it up to you. And don't be shy. Thank you, David, um, and thank you, all of you. It's really a, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to return to a question that Civil War historians used to argue about um, back in the 1980s, uh, and that was the nature or character of the Republican appeal. Um, all of the contributors to this debate, um, Eric Foner, William Gnapp, Joel Silby, Michael Holt, John Ashworth, all of them agree that uh, political ideology is a central feature, it was a central feature of sectional conflict and political realignment, and by political ideology, all of them just mean something like a worldview or a relatively coherent set of, uh, of beliefs. But there's no agreement among them about the character of the Republican appeal, um, and by extension, um, some of the causes of realignment in the 1850s. The focus um, for my remarks, uh, I'm going to focus on the disagreement between Foner and Gnapp, um, although Gnapp kind of folds in some of the concerns of, of <coughs> Michael Holt. And we can start uh, with just Foner's free labor story, which is familiar, but just to, just to do a couple of highlights. The free labor story talks about slavery degrading labor, um, the northern economic system was extolled, Lincoln talked about the right to rise. Um, small ind independent producers had a stake in uh, the story about the nation and the nature of the nation and aspirations uh, for social mobility. The slave power comes into the story, um, very familiar story, threatening the lifeblood of the nation, threatening the aspirations of laborers. Um, the notion of a safety valve was crucial here. The idea was that northern workers needed the West uh, to rise, so the West was a safety valve. Now, Gnapp comes in and he says, look, the free labor commitments clearly divided northerners from southern slave owners. Um, but Gnapp says it's not at all clear that free labor commitments divided Republicans um, from northern Democrats. And Gnapp turns to the slave power as the major construct, the master symbol of the Republican Party, which, which Gnapp identifies with Republican, small r Republican values. And this is where he's absorbing Holt, because Holt has emphasized that the essence of the Republican appeal were, were Republican values. So Gnapp frames free labor concerns as about economics, and he says slave power concerns were about republicanism, small r. And by republicanism, small r, he's referring to things like northern rights and liberties, um, free speech concerns. Um, I would even fold concerns about the fugitive slave clause um, into these small r Republican concerns um, in the North. The concern with aristocracy, the slave power was seen as an aristocracy under Republican principles. This is emphasized by Gnapp. Also that they were a political minority, um, exerting enormous political power. This is seen as a violation of republicanism. And the increasing extremity of Southern demands. All of this, according to Gnapp, generated a profound fear for Republican values, which was associated with the nation. Okay, so one thing that can be said, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it now, we can of course always talk about it later, um, I would offer the suggestion that Republican ideology, especially as articulated by Seward and, um, Seward and um, Lincoln, fused um, economic concerns with republicanism, that this is not a false split, um, and that this is not a false split is evidence in the very fact that arist aristocrats were conceived as non-producers. That very, that very equation undermines the idea that economic concerns and Republican small r concerns uh, were separate. The thing that I want to focus on um, is actually the presence in the Republican Party of what were called true Democrats, um, the true democracy. 
The, this is a group of political actors that I think haven't been well understood by historians. Um, True Democracy was their name. This is a group of ex-Democrats. They left the party in the 1830s. Um, they were coming out of Cincinnati and Ohio. Um, this is the Ohio Liberty Party, but they called themselves True Democrats. They were Democrats. Um, in New Hampshire, under the leadership of John Hale, also an ex-Democrat, they called themselves Independent Democrats. Um, these are not the barn burners. I really want to underscore this. These were not the Northern Democrats who said, we want the West for white labor. This was a group of ex-Democrats who said, the Democratic Party is not being true to the principle of equality. And these folks combined an embrace of the slave power argument. They're criticizing the slave power. They're also borrowing a Jacksonian concept, the money power, and they're building a simultaneous critique of the aristocrats of the South and the aristocrats of the North. And for them, the aristocrats of the North included merchants, financiers, some employers. Um, this is a version, this is a stream of anti-slavery discourse that I don't think we've had, we have enough of a grip on in terms of our understanding of party politics. Um, but at bottom, the fact that these true Democrats also launched a slave power critique as well as the Whig Republicans launching a slave power critique, what that means is that the slave power cannot be the essence of the Republican appeal. Um, and that's because these true Democrats are combining a slave power critique with a critique of the northern economic system. So something's going on here, and this is where I want to pick up. Um, the true Democrats, are the, their presence uh, is signaling not just that we need to expand our time horizons from the 1850s, we've got to look further back for the history of anti-slavery politics, as Jim has identified. I want to add another feature to this, which is the creation of this, this true Democrat political movement. Um, and it suggests, um, I want to put on the table, the idea that capitalist development in the North was more um, evolved, was more advanced, um, more developed. Uh, if you will, than has generally been recognized. And these true Democrats are appealing to an anti-slavery contingent that is less racist than one might imagine given conventional stories about uh, the Irish in New York City. Um, and these folks are not prospering under the growing capitalist system. So as a way of exploring these different appeals, the Whig, Democrat, the Whig Republican appeal and the, new, the, the true Democrat slash Republican appeal, I want to tie the question of these appeals to a question that economic historians of slavery used to talk about, again, back in the 1980s. I'm thinking of the, the Genoveses, I'm thinking of Gavin Wright, um, but I want to expand on their conceptualization in some crucial ways. Now what Genova the Genoveses and the Wright have proposed is that by 1790, by 1800, you had property systems in the North, a property system in the North in conflict with a property system in the South. Um, and that property system in the North, um, I don't have time to talk about it in, in detail, but critical feature, property in yourself, um, property in your labor. Uh, now, there, there was an evolution of this in the North. Uh, in practice, courts also got rid of something called specific performance. This was a feature of indented labor where workers, if they did not you know, finish out the terms of their contract, could be thrown in jail. This physical coercion, this element of labor law stopped to be operative, stopped being operative by the 1820s, although in practice it was much earlier. So we've got this property system in the North. Um, a feature of it is the gradual emancipation of the North from slavery, uh, but changes in property law uh, are, are vital here. And here today I just want to reference briefly two works uh, by, one by Charles Post and one by David Meyer, who give us some tools for thinking in new ways about capitalist context in the North. In the South, we obviously had a property system in slavery. Um, property in slavery is part of a system. Um, it's part of a system, and, and yet there's a hybrid. There's a hybrid dimension to this, uh, which I want to speak about. Slave owners were... Um, they traded in commodities, they got very wealthy, on the surface they look like capitalists, but they are not, this is not a capitalist system, um, but I want to talk about some features of the system that are both typical in, in Atlantic world slavery and unique to Atlantic world slavery, because I think once we broaden the context even this far, 
back to the rise of the Atlantic economy and the transatlantic slave trade, it gives us some purchase on when and how Southern Democrats amped up their demands. Okay, so just very briefly, some highlights from uh, Post and Meyer. One of the things that Charles Post does, he gives us a Marxist account of, of, of the Civil War, which I, I, um, I don't think we can reduce this to property systems. Um, and I, I don't think we can do some economic determinism here. But there's something that he contributes which is vital, um, in my view. And that is he talks about demythologizing the family farm. Um, and in a lot of Civil War history, that family farm is mythologized as independent. And Post gives us some tools for demythologizing this. And what he says is that, and again, I'm just going to do this very briefly, between 1790 and the late 1830s, family farms were no longer independent. They came under the subordination of what he calls the law of value. And that what that means is that they become embedded in northern markets. Um, they have to sell to survive. They must sell to survive. Um, they have to specialize output. They have to introduce labor-saving tools. They have to accumulate land, emphasis on accumulate land. And that by the, mid, by the mid to late 1830s, the cost of entry into Western farming was prohibitive for urban poor laborers. This fact is vital because it gives us some purchase on understanding not just the Republican appeal to these poor urban laborers, but whether or, not that, whether or not that appeal was at all feasible. Post suggests that that appeal was not feasible, and yet it was made. And so we've got these dependent, in fact, family farms, dependent in a particular sense. They're dependent on the market. They're dependent on credit for merchant capital. But they are not pursuing what was called a competency. Um, they, are, they have to grow. They have to grow to survive. Now, the thing for Meyer I want to pull in, um, David Meyer has a, has, a, has a new book out, and he talks about prosperous northern agriculture and industrialization as processes that happen together. They're interrelated, uh, and that we cannot understand industrialization in the north without understanding prosperity uh, among these, what are commercial uh, farms. Um, he gives us all kinds of information. He focuses on Philadelphia, the, the, the Philadelphia area, the Boston area, the New York area. These are regional metropolises. And lots of information about the steady rise in agricultural productivity, um, that folks are actually going to northern farms. Pro the population is rising in these rural areas, which seems counterintuitive uh, in the years before the Civil War. But the basic upshot is that between 1840 and 1860, we have these incredibly prosperous farms that are generating social differentiation. Folks with access to markets are doing well. Um, folks with good land are doing well. But there are a lot of folks now with social differentiation who are not doing well. On top of that, between 1840 and 1860, we have the fastest period of industrial growth in the 19th century. This is surprising to people. These, this is a rate of growth. Um, the number of employees in manufacturing is increasing threefold. Industrial productivity is increasing fivefold. Again, between 1840 and 1860, this shouldn't come altogether as a surprise given Irish immigration and the fact that labor scarcity was finally a, a problem that no longer existed for in industry in 1840. But again, underlying point, this is not the world of the small producer um, anymore. Now, lastly, um, I just wanted to come to this question of Southern Democratic aggression um, and their increasing demands and even the timing of, of, of secession. There are features of Southern slavery that were typical of Atlantic world slavery. And there were features of Southern slavery that were unique. And this combination I want to bring us back to because I think it's informative for understanding political realignment. Typical, there's a racial basis. Um, typical, slaves ran away. Typical, um, slave owners got very wealthy. Typical, slave property was compatible for a period of time with capitalist markets. Um, typical, a, a boom in a single export crop is what drives this wealth. We have this with cotton starting in 1800 when, when the South became Britain's primary uh, source and of course the huge boom in the 1850s. Also typical, busts 
follow these booms. And the bust was in some ways on the horizon already, but folks in the South could not and did not know that. Um, and so what's unique, resident planters, very important for understanding the formation of a slave society, also unique, profound regional political power, national political power. Um, this is unique in Atlantic world slavery, um, and I think this fact is absolutely vital uh, for understanding the timing. It's not just population growth in the north, that's obviously something that's familiar to us, but this is constitutional design. Um, this is the three-fifths clause. Um, this is overrepresentation in the House, which transforms into the Electoral College, which transforms into the presidency, which transforms into Supreme Court appointments. Um, the power, the political power of, of the Southern Democrats uh, is combining with this huge wealth that's being generated from a world market. Britain's industrialization, they are the market for cotton. Uh, in the 1830s to the 1850s in a profound way, and it's creating the sense that the South can do it on their own. They don't need the North. They don't need to stay in the Union anymore. They're going to secede South. They're going to annex Cuba. They're going to go South. Uh, and so the thing, I guess, that I want to underscore and close down with is this idea that we need to reintroduce property systems as a category of analysis. Uh, in our understanding of the Civil War. Now that's not to say, and I want to underscore this, no economic determinism, this is not, this is not progressive history. Our, our, our ways of thinking about property systems have to include the very fact that, and this is something David Eltis, uh, this is a wonderful article that David Eltis wrote a long time ago in the American Historical Review, where he says, look, people normally think about racial slavery as having an economic motive. Um, in fact, Eltis shows, if, if these empires in Europe wanted a cheap way of getting slavery in the New World, they should have enslaved Europeans. They should have enslaved convict labor in, in Europe, um, and there were means to do that. They should have enslaved poor people in Europe. There were means to do that. The cheapest way to put slavery in the New World was to enslave Europeans. Um, they didn't do that, and all by itself that undermines an economic determinist story um, of the South. So this notion of property system has, has to be very complicated um, and worked out. Gender obviously has to be a piece of this as well. The rights of Englishmen that were seen to be absolute English men. Um, but to reintroduce property systems as a category of analysis, I think we need to do that, not just to understand these true Democrats who were stepping out of the Democratic Party and fighting for not just the West but for the country and ultimately this fight between Whig Republicans and these true Democrats over what, the, what was the problem in the country and how you were going to fix it. The new Democrats said, yeah, we got to get rid of the slave power, we got to stop extension, but we also have to do something about the northern economic order. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So as David mentioned, uh, 2017 is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Andrew Jackson. Um, and as we all know, uh, but as our president seemed a little confused about during one of his musings on American history, Andrew Jackson was not alive in the era we're here to discuss, the Civil War era. But his ideas very much were. And the populist political style that Andrew Jackson pioneered provided a template for Americans across the political spectrum to approach the sectional crisis over slavery in the 1840s and 1850s. And today, some Americans are also looking to that Jacksonian template for politics. During the secession crisis, many Americans yearn for an hour of Jackson, while today, some see Trump as reviving the Jackson style. And President Trump himself has embraced the idea that he is a modern day old hickory. Earlier, earlier this year, he went to the Hermitage to celebrate Andrew Jackson's birthday and declared, I'm a fan, I'm a big fan. He drew a parallel between his anti-establishment, drain-the-swamp populism with that of Jackson, who, he asserted, confronted and defied an arrogant elite 
and reclaimed the people's government from an emerging aristocracy. Seemingly rehabilitated, Old Hickory's portrait has returned to the Oval Office. Liberals have responded to Trump's populist Jackson-style victory with soul-searching over how to reconnect with the people. Earlier this week, for instance, Columbia professor Mark Lilla uh, gave a talk here on his new book, The Once and Future Liberal, After Identity Politics, in which he advises liberals to abandon the politics of race, gender, and sexuality for a more universal notion of American citizenship. And Lilla's book is only one example of liberals scrambling to try to figure out how to reconnect with the broad swath of so-called forgotten Americans whom Trump allegedly speaks to. Others have likewise recommended that the Democratic Party cease to be the party of identity politics and rebrand itself or return itself to being a party of class-based or economic appeals. And some Democrats think that they can do that. They can win back the white middle class without also pandering to the sexism, racism, homophobia, and xenophobia that lurks on the right. And I would suggest that a choice the choice between a colorblind populism of political economy and a populism of identity politics is an artificial one, which is borne out when we look at Jacksonian populism in the Civil War era. American populism, as pioneered by the Jacksonians, has always been both a populism of political economy and a populism of identity politics, and in this case, a populism of white male identity. Jackson taught his followers to conceptualize politics as a struggle between the nation's natural majority of virtuous producers and entrenched economic elites and corrupt monopolies. And Jacksonians first, of course, mobilized in the 1820s and 1830s against the money power, a conspiratorial cabal of financial elites and corrupt government officials. Scholars then have then charted how that Jacksonian appeal endured into the Civil War era with uh, historians like Arthur Schlesinger and Sean Wilentz talking about how anti-slavery Jacksonians substituted the slave power for the money power in later decades in the 1840s and 1850s, and this caused them to actually leave the ancestral party, leave the party of Jackson, in order to fight monopoly in its new guise. The Democratic Party of the 1850s thus becomes merely an appendage of the slave power. And as Pamela mentioned, those who were true Democrats seem to exist outside the Democratic Party. These accounts emphasize the pivotal role of anti-slavery Jacksonians in the fight against slavery, and they often de-emphasize the racism of Jacksonians. They find something worth preserving in the Jacksonian legacy at times, and seek to differentiate it from a political party, the Democratic Party of the 1850s, that's increasingly pro-slavery, pro-Southern, and under the leadership of the feckless doe faces like Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan. For some of these scholars, the Jacksonian legacy should belong to Abraham Lincoln's Republicans and not Stephen Douglas's Democrats. Yet what of those Democrats, the ones who actually were in the Democratic Party in the Civil War era, an often malign group and an often historiographically ignored group? Were they also true Democrats? And I would say yes the 1850s Democratic Party was still the party of Jackson. And once we recognize that, that raises interesting implications for any assessment of Jacksonian populism or the politics that Jackson pioneered. Like Republicans in the Civil War era, the Democratic Party also detected a dangerous monopoly which threatened white men's liberties and the Union itself. But it was not the slave power. It was what we can call the anti-slavery power. Instead of protesting against slavery and slaveholders, Democrats detected a conspiracy among abolitionists, anti-slavery Republicans, a whole host of fanatical reformers, and their African-American allies. Democrats believed these reformers wanted to consolidate governmental power to undemocratically take away white men's liberties through their reforms. The anti-slavery power for these Democrats replaced the money power in their Jacksonian populist formula. And for an example of this, Governor Henry Wise of Virginia in 1857, he reminisced that Jackson once had to contend with the money power, and he subdued it by the Samson of democracy, the Democratic Party. We now have to meet the black demon of abolitionism, Wise alerted the present generation. 
and the same Samson survives in vigor to fight for the chosen people. The Democratic Party continued to be white men's champion. In 1860, a Democratic pamphleteer similarly noticed that a remarkable phenomenon has arisen in our history. The anti-slavery feeling, so impotent a few years ago, now aspires to control the Union. The anti-slavery feeling, the Republican power, was this new grasping monopoly which threatened not just white men's economic rights, but their very identity as white men. These anti-slavery Americans also fit into the Jacksonian template for politics by being seen as arrogant elites who thought they knew better than the people. Abolitionists and anti-slavery Republicans, Democrats charged, really didn't care about the average white man and certainly not about enslaved Americans. Uh, a Connecticut Democrat from just down the road in Madison wrote in his diary in 1860, Republicans do not care a pin for the Negro if they can carry their point so as to elect an anti-slavery president and get the advantage of 15 slave states. This anti-slavery power disingenuously stirred up anti-slavery sentiment merely to consolidate their own political position. Cultural resentment helps explain some of the democratic antipathy toward the anti-slavery movement because Jackson had taught white men to bristle at any dictation or condescension from others. And these abolitionists were seen as the ultimate in arrogance because they presumed to lecture white men on racial equality. Sounding like populist conservatives today railing against out-of-touch coastal elites, Southern and Midwestern Democrats complained about New England chauvinism in the 1850s. The anti-slavery power thus can be seen as one last attempt by the cosmopolitan ghost of John Quincy Adams to exact his revenge on Andrew Jackson and the country's plain-spoken laborers and yeomen. Indiana Democrats, for example, hated New England tramping lecturers who traversed the Midwest and presumed to instruct them on racial equality, black suffrage, and temperance. They were those who regard the people of Indiana as little children, incapable of making laws themselves. And thus Republicans joined a long line of Jacksonian enemies who doubted white men's capacity for self-government, joining Whigs, Federalists, and even Tories in that pantheon. Democrats resented anybody who questioned democracy, the white men's democracy, and especially white men's democratic power to decide the fate of Americans of color and women. And the key debate in the 1850s becomes popular sovereignty, the power of white men in the territories to democratically decide the status of African Americans in the territories. This was seen as the ultimate distillation of Jacksonian democracy for the Democratic Party. And as much as the Democratic Party is of the 1850s is derided as a shill for the slave power, as a pro-slavery, pro-Southern organization. It was a genuine and passionate advocate of white men's democracy in a very real sense, uh, which leads to a whole host of questions about American democracy itself, if this was a consummately democratic party. In the Jacksonian mind, furthermore, further linking Democrats of the 1850s to, the, to Jackson, Submitting to a monopoly, whatever that monopoly is, whether it was the money power of old or the Civil War era's slave power or the anti-slavery power, was to be enslaved. Submitting to a monopoly was to be enslaved with the racial and gender connotations that carries with it. It was a forfeiture of whiteness and manhood. In 1837, a Jacksonian, a true, one of the, I think that we can class as a true Democrat, William Leggett, had urged the people to fight the money power lest the fetter, now riven almost asunder, will be riveted anew and hold us in slavery forever. This trope of enslavement and racial degradation before a monopoly of concentrated power continued into the Civil War era. And this has in part fueled a lot of anti-slavery Jacksonians to leave the Democratic Party and protest the slave power. And they brought their racism at times with them into the anti-slavery movement. Yet for every one of these northern men who feared enslavement to the slave power, there were white men in the north and in the south who allied together in their fear of enslavement to the anti-slavery power. An Alabama Democrat thus cautioned against this concentrated power in the anti-slavery movement, and he mused that the rights of the slaveholder will not be the only rights invaded, but every privilege dear to free men will be destroyed. And Northern Democrats agreed with this. They often saw their rights as white men linked, bound up with the rights of white men in the South, and the 
autonomy of the South over questions of race relations and slavery. And thus was the Democratic Party, and this is very much underappreciated in the historiography, able to hold together a national party all the way until 1860. We know it fractured. We know it was losing electoral strength. We know perhaps it was flailing in the culture wars of the Civil War era, losing ground on certain issues, including their conception of patriarchy, as Jim Oakes mentioned. But they were still a national party. And they were a national party that was a populist coalition of white men who coalesced on a political ideology when the 1850s democracy is seen as lacking substantive principles, and they coalesced around shared assumptions of whiteness, manhood, and household mastery. They united white men in the North and in the South, not through opportunism, but through shared assumptions and political theory. They united Protestants and Catholics, and they united foreign and native-born white men. This was the party that was most passionate often in its denunciation of nativism. And this is a, a question, this is a topic that is, I think, underappreciated in that the Northern Democratic Party, even if it is incre increasingly a minority within the North, was still part of a much larger national party, and it was a vibrant party. And on the eve of the Civil War, it also continued to be Jackson's party raising troubling implications about the populism he bequeathed and those who would try to invoke it today. Old Hickory imparted an enduring way for us to imagine our politics, the people versus the powerful. And so compelling was this worldview that it animated both sides in the debates over slavery, fighting the slave power and becoming and joining the anti-slavery movement, or hunkering down in the party of Jackson to fight abolition. Jacksonians fighting the slave power helped galvanize the anti-slavery movement into a mass movement, but it also inspired a, a virulent politics of white supremacy within Jackson's original party. Jacksonian populism was the identity politics of the Civil War era. The seamlessness with which Jacksonians transitioned from their fiscal populism against the money power in the 1820s and 1830s to their white supremacist populism in the 1850s suggests that economic and white supremacist appeals cannot be easily disentangled when trying to be deployed in a populist style. Democrats united white men nationwide in the 1850s, not against the, enemies of not against the agents of economic inequality, but against the advocates of racial equality. So as politicians today on the right and on the left flirt with the populist style, and as some on the left would even seek to emulate Trump's populism, we should remember that populism in U.S. history has rarely been inclusive. And I would suggest in closing that on Old Hickory's 250th birthday, let's let Donald Trump keep Andrew Jackson's populist legacy all to himself. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you to David, Michelle, Tom, Melissa, uh, Daniel, and thank you all for being here. Welcome. Over the past 20, 25 years, we've witnessed an erosion of the American political center, whatever that was, as well as over the last year or so, something that looks a lot like realignment of the party system, as populist movements on both the right and the left, though not morally equivalent, both take aim at the establishments of the major parties, Republican and Democrat. And all of this has refocused attention on that abiding theme in American history of coalition building in a democratic republic, specifically on the relationship between popular movements and electoral politics, or what Sean Wilentz calls uh, between the politicians and the egalitarians. Behind that, of course, are larger themes about means versus ends, morality versus expediency, and uh, radicals versus moderates, a whole, a whole host of issues which are very familiar to historians of the anti-slavery movement who have long been focused on what Caleb McDaniel has called the bonds and bounds of big tent anti-slavery. The rise of anti-slavery politics is, I think, a classic example in the American past of a movement interacting with politicians in a way that advanced a great moral cause. That movement ultimately produced a revolutionary party, the Republican Party, which believed in, among other things, equal protection of the law and expansion of human liberty. 
What made the, Republicans party, uh, the Republican Party, I should say, revolutionary, in my opinion, is that it uh, broke pretty dramatically from the Madisonian compromise tradition of fundamental human rights. It melded together moral principles and power politics, confronting the so-called slave power oligarchy in the very seat of its power, Congress and the federal government, and eventually overthrowing not just the slave power, but the kind of politics that had created and enabled the slave power in the first place. Now, these two groups within the anti-slavery coalition, which I've identified, we can call them uh, the politicians and egalitarians in Sean's phrase, uh, were often suspicious of one another, sometimes outright hostile toward one another, but they were bound together by, among other things, a common faith in American institutions, above all, the U.S. Constitution. And so this morning I'm going to say a few words about anti-slavery constitutionalism and how it served as a kind of nexus between the abolitionist movement and anti-slavery politicians. Anti-slavery constitutionalism, uh, at least in its basic contours, predates the rise of second wave radical abolitionism after 1830. For a wide variety of Americans uh, from the 1790s on, the Constitution was not just a blueprint for government, that is, the architecture for a confederal union, it was also a bulwark of human liberty. Again, not just white liberty, not just American liberty, but human liberty. And of course, these Americans read the Constitution through the prism of the Declaration of Independence, in particular, the egalitarian ideal of all men are created equal. And they read that, that phrase quite literally, as all men, not all white men, are endowed with a natural right of self-ownership and are entitled to certain uh, legal and civil protections of that natural right, among others. According to this view of the Constitution, uh, the Constitution recognized slaves not as chattel property, but as legal persons entitled to certain basic rights. Applied to the U.S. federal system, what this meant was that the U.S. government rested on what Abraham Lincoln called uh, a foundation of human rights and operated on a legal presumption of freedom. That is to say, all persons should be presumed to be free regardless of skin color. Slavery, on the other hand, was said to be a strictly state institution that is uh, instituted, regulated, and abolished by the states alone, hence the Republican Party's famous slogan, Freedom National Slavery Sectional. And on a more technical level, but crucial to understanding anti-slavery politics, is the emphasis in anti-slavery constitutionalism on the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, which prohibited Congress from depriving persons of their liberty or their property. And from an anti-slavery perspective, what that meant was that Congress could not establish or maintain slavery in areas under its direct jurisdiction because to do so would be to deprive persons, slaves, of their liberty, of their property in themselves. These views of the Constitution were held by what I call uh, the anti-slavery mainstream, that is to say anti-slavery politicians, anti-slavery jurists, uh, as well as the majority of abolitionists. It did not include the more vocal, the more famous Garrisonian faction of the abolitionists, nor the uh, smaller uh, radical constitutional wing of the abolitionist movement, two groups that were hugely important to the anti-slavery movement, uh, which I would like to get to perhaps in Q&A, but I'm going to set aside now to focus on the mainstream. Now, anti-slavery constitutionalism, such as I've described it, uh, may seem almost like common sense to us in our post-emancipation world, but it stood well outside the mainstream of antebellum politics and political culture. Beginning in the middle 1820s, the uh, so-called second party system of Jacksonian Democrats and opposition Whigs, while they disagreed on many policies, together instituted a systematic shutdown of all discussion of slavery and national politics, which, uh, for reasons we can get into later, uh, maintained the functionally pro-slavery regime which had unfolded over the course of the early republic. And of course, the second party system celebrated the ideology of unionism, that is, uh, that national politics in the United States absolutely depended on compromise between the two sections, North and South, and which viewed the Constitution as itself a product of that kind of compromise, as well as a template for the kind of compromise politics to which national politicians should aspire. So Henry Clay comes to mind, Martin Van Buren, at least before 1848, comes to mind, Daniel Webster, 
John Kelly these days. Uh, my main point here is that my main point here is that in antebellum politics, in antebellum political culture, there was virtually no space for the anti-slavery constitutionalism I described earlier, and therefore no space for an anti-slavery politics, or at least a mass viable, powerful politics. And of course that changed in the 1830s with the arrival of so-called second wave radical abolitionism. Among many other things, the, the abolitionists pushed back against this shutdown in government by forcing anti-slavery politicians and jurists in the North, so-called moderates, to defend, sometimes act on, anti-slavery constitutional principles more aggressively than they had in the past. And throughout this process, abolitionists channeled their uh, uh, energies toward political ends. Among other things, the second wave abolitionists were the first to create this country's first truly national anti-slavery project. Uh, that project was known alternately as denationalization or divorce, and essentially it called upon Congress to completely withdraw its support for slavery in areas under its direct jurisdiction. So in Washington, D.C., in the federal territories, in U.S. coastal waters from Cape May down to the Sabine River, Congress could take action against chattel slavery. The northern states could uh, join Congress in this process by passing personal liberty laws and depriving slave owners from the South, sojourners, uh, the right to hold slaves within their state lines even temporarily. Needless to say, we can get into the details later, abolitionists pressed this program relentlessly into Congress, state courts, legislatures in the form of petitions, speeches, questionnaires for candidates, and uh, lawsuits. And as we know, their actions uh, provoked an intense pro-slavery reaction from slave owners and their allies in the North. But that reaction also forced anti-slavery jurists, anti-slavery politicians, to defend anti-slavery constitutionalism, and especially at the state level, to actually implement parts of the abolitionist project. I'd like to, to explain an example now, but I'm going to set it aside. Maybe we can come back to it during Q&A. Limited time here. Uh, meanwhile, the abolitionists took these legal opinions and developed them into even more aggressive, more radical constitutional doctrines in line with their theory of immediate emancipation all the while developing that due process line of reasoning I mentioned earlier. The net result of this rather limited relationship between uh, abolitionists and anti-slavery politicians is that it creates a kind of space within the antebellum constitutional order and political culture for a more aggressive anti-slavery politics that potentially has mass voter appeal, at least in the North, and is therefore more viable and potent as a political movement. Later on, in the wake of the Wilmot Proviso, the first great rupture in the second party system, uh, the so-called political abolitionists, those who advocated direct political action against slavery in third parties or through independent candidates, particularly the so-called coalitionists among them, those who wanted to work with the anti-slavery dissidents within the major parties, virtually ensured that the chief platform of anti-slavery politics rested on the due process line of reasoning in anti-slavery constitutionalism rather than on mere legislative precedent. So let me explain that uh, very briefly. The moderate majorities within the Free Soil and Republican parties initially sought to base their opposition to slavery's extension in the territories on the old Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which had been a positive ban on Congress in the old Northwest. That's to say it was a kind of legislative precedent, the idea being Congress has banned slavery from the territories before, Congress can do it again. But political abolitionists, having fought these fundamental questions for a while by this point, recognized that that platform was rather weak, that it failed to address the full range of aggressions of the so-called slave power, as well as the fundamental question of whether the, um, the United States as a nation or as an empire would rest on freedom or slavery. And so political abolitionists pressed their colleagues in the Free Soil and Republican parties to ground their policy of non-extension on the due process line of reasoning I mentioned earlier, that Congress has no power under the Constitution to establish uh, slavery in the Western territories because to do so would be to deprive persons of their liberty, of their property in themselves. And this was the platform which emerged from the Free Soil Party, 48, 
1852, and then, then again in the Republican Party, 1856, 1860, and you can look, it's the eighth plank in the 1860 platform. You'll see this due process line of reason. And what it did was create a kind of spectrum or sliding scale within the Repu uh, Republican coalition such that one could endorse the relatively limited, moderate position of non-extension and yet implicitly give his endorsement to the idea of freedom is national, slavery is sectional. That is, Congress not only has the power to take action against slavery in areas under its jurisdiction, but ought to do so as well, something which the old parties would never have said. This is why I think the Republican Party was a revolutionary party, because it broke pretty dramatically from the old Madisonian uh, tradition of compromising fundamental human rights. And if you think about it, anti-slavery constitutionalism is not just a blueprint for defending northern liberties against the aggressions of the slave power. It was also a blueprint for an alternative nation state premised on fundamental human equality and uniform freedom throughout the American nation state and empire. So, to conclude, it should go without saying that deep structural change in our society today will require both movements and politicians working together to some extent. Even just interacting would be enough. But it helps, as several commentators have noted, if a given movement at least understands power politics, how it works, how it can be influenced, what it is. It also helps, and here the, the controversy uh, or debate around Mark Lilla's recent book comes to mind, if there's a kind of ideological bridge linking movements to politicians. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Constitution, but this is an example. What I find most interesting is that today, the kind of political organizing I've described in the anti-slavery movement appears to be happening, and I could be wrong about this, we should discuss this, appears to be happening more on the right than on the left. I mean, at least in the last decade or so, what I've described is very reminiscent of what we've seen in the Tea Party movement, uh, uh, which is not a strictly a grassroots movement, to be sure, but the organizing, its embrace of the Constitution. And in fact, anti-slavery constitutionalism, I think, is quite attractive to modern conservatism, what with its enshrinement of the classical liberal ideal of setting limits on the central state in order to expand individual liberty. One could even go further and say that the anti-slavery project of denationalization of slavery has overtones of Steve Bannon's project of deconstructing the modern liberal state. But Make no mistake, anti-slavery politics, anti-slavery constitutionalism are legacies of the left in America. And yet, I think, we are seeing much less emphasis on this kind of political organizing, at least so far, on the left today. I think it would be a mistake, however, for the left to ignore this anti-slavery political heritage. Because as many people in this room know, the Constitution can be, has been, a very, very powerful weapon for expanding human liberty and protecting the rights of the powerless. It should not be dismissed as a mere bastion of privilege and pa uh, power. And I'm reminded to conclude uh, by the, uh, I'm reminded of the words of the English social historian E.P. Thompson, not about the Constitution, but I'm applying it. While the law can be seen to mediate and to legitimize existing class relations, it also has a distinct identity which may on occasion inhibit power and afford some protection to the powerless. Thank you. I wonder when E.P. Thompson might emerge. <laughs> um, oh yeah, take the mics. That's amazing. Brilliant insights, all kinds of information, and they all stayed to time. Remarkable. Now, I promised you we save time for Q&A, for you to get engaged. So this is your chance. Questions? Uh, Steve, back there. Thank you very much for your talks. If the Tea Party is a party of grievance, as many of the current Republicans are, of white grievances, is that parallel to what was happening in the 1850s? I, I think there are parallels, and I think we have to maybe reconceptualize, for at least for the 1850s, grievance. I think part of it is it's a 
you know, maybe the white backlash of the 1850s. Uh, but it's not really, it's, it's not always presented as reaction in the 1850s. It's presented as, um, as I would argue for the 1850s Democratic Party, as a positive vision of national development in the future. Their idea that it's a white man's democracy, it's a genuine democracy, it's a progressive democracy. This is the party that still called itself the progressive party. Right. They use, in the same sentence, they call themselves conservatives, liberals, and progressives. Uh, they're passionate advocates of separation of church and state and rights of immigrants and passionate advocates of white supremacy. So I think the parallel, if in fact today it's all about grievance and backlash, can be overstated with drawing it to the uh, parallels to the 1850s Democratic Party, at least. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Okay. Up here, Matt Carp. And then, need to see your hand. Hey, uh, a really fascinating discussion. I think I'm tomorrow, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to go over this ground a lot in the next uh, couple days. So I'm going to definitely, uh, in conversation with Pamela and, and, and uh, Josh and Joe too. But I guess I had a question for Josh. Um, I guess I'm sort of skeptical about this idea, just on your conc concluding note, that the 1850s are a kind of cautionary tale against populism. It seems to me that the case that even you made yourself is that this is the kind of laboratory argument for the idea that you know, the only way to defeat a reactionary populism, like your sort of how you presented Jacksonian populism, is with a sort of a left-wing egalitarian populism, the anti-slavery populism that, um, that you know, Joe talked about. I mean, it seems to me that the alternative to that, you know, the only people in the 1850s who sort of really abjured any kind of populism whatsoever would be the sort of, um, you know, moderate Whiggish types, um, a kind of an elite um, uh, consensus politics of Daniel Webster, or, you know, what Lincoln called the, you know, the old exclusive silk stocking Whiggery, um, you know, which in, which in its which in its kind of very restrained conservative way had a, a degree of inclusivity in the sense that you know that those conservative Whigs were more sympathetic to say black rights than the Jacksonian populace, but nevertheless proved completely unable to deal with the slave power or with that reactionary populism. And the only the only party that could is the revolutionary, and I, I think also popular populist party that Joe described. So I just, I, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm sure people were cringing at some of my uses of the word populist because social scientists, political scientists, and historians sometimes use it in different ways and can be criticized, criticize each other for sloppiness in it. I think it's important to distinguish between populism and just popular politics or democratic politics, lowercase d. And so the populism I would identify of the late antebellum era is, I would say, is all a variant of Jacksonian populism, which I would argue cannot be separated from ideas of, of race and gender. And so there's, if there is a, a liberal colorblind populism in the 1850s, I'm not exactly sure where it is, there could be a popular politics that is doing that, but the, the Jacksonian template for populism, I think, in the 1850s, Whoever is using it, it's very hard to separate it from race. Even the anti-slavery Jacksonians. Race may have not been their motivation to jump ship into the anti-slavery movement, but often they carried their racial assumptions with them. Um, so where the colorblind, really progressive populism is, and where it is throughout American history, I think it's, I, th I would say it's hard to identify genuinely populist movements that or as you described, and so I think that I think it's a very debatable point. But can I can I just add something here? Sure. Um, I, I don't want to wade into the debate about what counts as populism, but for the radical Jacksonians, I think I would just add that William Hayton in Philadelphia, um, he's the leader of the Philadelphia Working Men's Party, uh, and he's a labor organizer. And I think Hayton has a reputation among historians as actually not being concerned with slavery, but. Um, if you actually look at his newspaper and you look at what he's saying and what he's doing, the, the Mechanics Free Press is absolutely chock full of anti-slavery and abolition um, sentiment. Abolition in the sense that they say, look, there should be immediate emancipation, but anti-slavery in the sense that you start to see the program of divorce um, articulated very, very early among these working men. And, and this constitutional project of divorce is something that Thomas Morris, again, an ex-Democrat, somebody who I'm calling a true Democrat, they call themselves true Democrats, um, they're articulating this. And so one of the ways in which Hayden and, and the Philadelphia working men and people even like Fannie Wright in New York, um, some of the New York uh, labor organizers, 
they are still part of, and they, they're working in an intellectual context in which theories of um, ethnology from the Enlightenment era are still surviving. Um, so this is a little bit of a debate between George Fredrickson and Winthrop Jordan about when these old, these Enlightenment era of uh, theories of science and people's sort of decline. They're still in the atmosphere, the idea that we are still one people. Um, and the rising ethnologies of the, the racist um, ethnologies really are power charged by what's going on when the Cotton Kingdom in the 1830s. And so there's actually historical context.